Good morning, everyone. If you are new here, my name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors here at First Free Church, and it is an honor to be able to share with you this morning from the Word of God. We're going to open that up in just a minute. But before I do that, in case you missed the announcements at the beginning of this service, I want to remind you of something that we're doing next week. We are launching into a new series on the book of Nehemiah. And it's called Leading the Way. It's going to be leadership lessons from the story of Nehemiah. And we're going to learn all about that. As we do that, we're going to try something new, okay? And this is what we're doing. This is what was in the announcements this morning. We are offering a study journal to go along with the series. And here's what we're doing for this. We've got this little study journal uh, that we created. We actually licensed the text of the Bible to put in here the whole book. So we've got the whole book of, of Nehemiah in here with the text in Scripture on one side and a note space on the other side in case you want to go through with us and take notes along the way. And why are we doing this? Well, one of the reasons is, as we're working through this book, um, this will be an opportunity for you to have something that you can keep with you. It's all in one place, as opposed to if you take notes on the back of our program, you'll just have it in one place. It lays nice and flat so you can write on it easily. And you can underline and circle and draw lines through the text and do whatever you want to it, and then make connections to your notes over here. So this is actually how I typically study the Bible. I will have the Bible on one side and a spot for my notes on the other, and I will go through and make notes and copy things and, and do all kinds of annotations, and that's how I learn and remember things. And one of the things that we think is really cool is if this goes well, and if it doesn't, uh, we trust you'll let us know. But if this goes well, we may end up with doing this for every time we do kind of a book study like this, and that would mean that in, you know, five years, you might end up with 20 of these things, and you can go back and see, here's when we studied Nehemiah, and here's when we studied this book and that book, and have a collection of all of your notes and what you learned and go back to them. Just a cool kind of spiritual growth resource that is available for you. So there's a suggested donation for these. You can get them today at our welcome centers in the lobby out there if you want to do that. Uh, if you can't donate, please don't feel the need to. We want you to have this more than we want you to donate. So if you can help recoup some of the costs, that's great. If not, just take one. We want you to have it as we go through the book of Nehemiah together. Well, today we're going to, to close our series called And Rejoicing. And one of the neat things about the last couple of months has just been to hear your stories of how you have faced some challenging times, many of you, over the last couple of months. And because of this series and the messages in this series, God has reminded you, prompted you, convicted you about your need to rejoice in the middle of those. And I'm no different, because I've also faced some challenging things the last couple of months, some difficult circumstances that I would ordinarily find a really hard time rejoicing in, and yet I'm reminded that I'm about to preach that week, and so I have no choice. I have to rejoice in them, no matter what I'm going through, because otherwise I'm going to be a hypocrite. So we are talking about rejoicing, and today we're going to wrap up this series. Uh, there's, there's one thing that we haven't really covered in detail yet. And that is something that I think is the biggest stealer of your joy. It's a joy thief. At times when you ought to be joyful, this is what comes along and just keeps you from being able to do that when you go through difficult times. Today, we're going to talk about worry and anxiety. Okay, worry and anxiety. Does that worry anybody here? Does that make you anxious that we're going to talk about your worry and anxiety? That's what we're going to do. And so we're going to spend some time looking at what the Bible says about worry and anxiety. And I don't think I have to really try to convince you that we are a very worried people, that we struggle with a lot of anxiety just in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, as Americans in this country, we, are, we tend to be one of the most anxious and worried peoples in the world. Last year, a survey was done that found that 40% of Americans believed they were more worried this year than they were last year, the previous year. And so we're a very worried people. The top worries that they talked about were health, safety, finances, politics, and relationships. And like many of you, I have struggled with periods in my life where I have been just overwhelmed by worry. Worry is the what-if disease. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this doesn't happen? What if that doesn't happen? What if my child doesn't do well in school? What if I fail my test? What if it's cancer? What if I get in an accident? What if I lose my job? What if I never recover from this? What if this problem never goes away? What if he never grows out of this? What if she never comes back? All these what ifs and worries that we can have in our life, and it doesn't just affect us psychologically, it also affects us physically as well. 
Worry can have an incredible impact on your appetite and your habits, your relationships, your sleep, and your job performance. Worry can lead, this is, I think, one of the most damaging aspects of worry. It can lead to developing really unhealthy coping mechanisms that maybe under normal circumstances in moderation wouldn't be, wouldn't be a bad thing, but they can become an obsession and eventually become an addiction. And some of them are just bad things naturally, and they become an addiction because they're an unhealthy coping mechanism to distract us from those worries that we face. Does any of that resonate with you? Any of you feel, well, you see hands going up. I wasn't even asking for hands, but yeah, it resonates with me. Worry that causes us to, to struggle in our daily lives. It's not the way God wants us to live. And so I hope that today's message will challenge your perception of worry and even your perception of how the Bible tells us to handle worry because it may not be what you're thinking. When the Bible talks about worry and anxiety, it does not give us cute little Christian cliches. It doesn't give us clean little tight answers that if you just kind of do this one thing, this one simple trick and your worries will go away forever. That is not what the Bible says. That's sometimes how we make it out to sound, but that is not what the Bible says. So the first thing I want you to remember, kind of the big, the big idea for today that we're gonna unpack and talk about how to do this later is this. You have a lot more control over your worrying than you think. You have a lot more control over your worrying than you think, and that is incredibly biblical. I will, I will show you that later. You have a lot more control over your worrying than you think. Now notice I did not say you have a lot more control over what you're worrying about than you think. You may have some control over it. You may need to take action about the thing that you are so worried about, but you may not. What you do have a lot of control over is your worrying. I think the Bible makes that very clear. Before we get into that, though, I have two clarifications that I feel I have to make right at the beginning here. And I think this is so important. The first thing that you need to understand is that what I'm going to share with you today though it is a step-by-step -step process, it is not a quick fix. This is not a one-and-done type of thing. This is not a miracle pill where you just follow this process, do these things, and your worries are all going to melt away. That is not how it works. That's not how the Bible says it works. This is not going to take away your need to constantly come back to God, to trust in Him, to rely on Him in the midst of those things that would make you worry. In fact, the process we're going to talk about today will drive you to him again and again and again. Secondly, we need to acknowledge the fact that some of us here today struggle with worry and anxiety to such an extent that it would be classified as an anxiety disorder. And so if that's you, you may have intense physical symptoms where it's not just a worry in your mind, but you may actually have some physical symptoms, some panic attacks, some things, some other emotional symptoms that come along with this, some things that are not necessarily easily controllable. Then you feel trapped in those and you wrestle with those on a every day, maybe every hour, sometimes every minute sort of basis. They're always there with you. Statistically, about 6% of the people in this room and watching online have sought treatment for some type of anxiety disorder. Also statistically, probably another 12% or so have an anxiety disorder of some kind and haven't sought treatment, but probably should. Those numbers go up for younger people. So 13 to 25 year olds, that number goes up to 25% probably have some kind of diagnosable anxiety disorder. And there are all kinds of things that play into that and lead into that. And for the most part, that is beyond the scope of this morning's message. We don't have time to unpack those kinds of deep issues, but we need to acknowledge them. We need to acknowledge that they exist. And, and still, what we're gonna talk about this morning, if that's you, what we're gonna talk about this morning will be incredibly helpful for you. But we just need to acknowledge the fact that for, for some of you, you just need to understand that you're not alone. That there are others who are wrestling with it to the level that you are. And I've talked to people in our early service who that's their struggle. And they acknowledge that, yeah, this is a different thing for me than what most people wrestle with. This is a, this is a deep, constant thing that I struggle with. And they've been seeking treatment for decades. You need to know that you're not alone in all of that. 
Uh, you need to know that there are a lot of causes for that kind of anxiety. A lot of things that lead to it. It can come from trauma. It can come from the environment that you were raised in or, or physical or emotional abuse. And certainly the things that young people deal with these days with pressure online and bullying and things that they have at school increases the problem of this even more for our young people. Anxiety disorders can be the cause or can be caused by sin that's allowed to take root in our minds. It can be caused by worry that's allowed to fester and grow and develop and not treated appropriately over time. It can be caused by brain issues that we don't fully understand even with modern medical science. We really don't know how all that stuff works. And here's the thing, look, we live in a fallen world, right? We have bodies that are under a curse that exists because the first two humans sinned. And so we struggle with issues and we wrestle with things and sometimes we're born with those things. We have all kinds of genetic variants and, and issues that we might be born with or develop over time because our bodies break down and that includes our minds. And so there are certain anxieties and anxiety disorders that you may have just always have, or you may not feel like you have a lot of control over, you may not have a lot of control over, and you wrestle with it, and you have panic attacks, and you have other things that come up in your life, and the last thing you need to hear today is a preacher saying, just read this verse, say this prayer, and it's all going to get better. That's not how it works, and we get that. This will still be helpful for you, but what you probably need more than just a a sermon today, as important as a good sermon is, let me tell you, I am not at all trying to diminish the value of a good sermon or biblical principles, believe me. But what you probably need is to spend some time with a Christian brother or sister who can walk you through a path of recovery. It's what Paul talks about in Galatians 6 when he says, hey, you believers, you need to come alongside some of these other believers who are struggling and show them the right path with gentleness. It's not an easy thing. It's not an immediate thing. It takes time. It's something we have to walk through. But if, if anxiety and chronic worry is a problem for you, something that you wouldn't just classify as a normal life struggle but a true disorder, you may need to see a Christian counselor. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. We also have care groups here at the church that help out with that. I think this will still help you. I think that a good Christian counselor would actually go through the stuff we're going to go through today, but as part of a broader anxiety treatment plan. I think it's so important that we acknowledge this right at the front because otherwise, any of you who are struggling with this and some of you who aren't, you can just, you can forget all that. But any of you who are, if we didn't go through this, the rest of what I have to say this morning, you might be at risk of just shutting it out because you're gonna hear it and go, yeah, that's just flip the worry switch and you don't worry anymore. That's what the Bible says. That's not what it says. And there are some serious conditions that you may need to seek help with. So we have to recognize that right up front. So what I want to do now is pray for us. Pray that God would open the scriptures to us, that he would teach us what the Bible has to say about an appropriate biblical response to our worries. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. And we're, and we're thankful for your continued investment in us despite our weakness, our sin, our worries, our anxiety, the things that, that threaten to distract us from you in a relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that today you would reveal from your word how we can deal appropriately with the worries that we have. And I even think about my preparation for this week and the, the worries that I struggled with in preparing a message about worry. It's something that all of us are affected by. So Lord, would you teach us today, teach us from your word the right way to handle this so that we can walk closely with you and be used by you. And we'll give you all the thanks and the glory and the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Philippians chapter four. We're gonna kind of combine two messages into one today because we had to skip a message because of the weather. So we're just gonna trust God on that one and say he probably wanted it to work out that way. And we're just gonna sort of merge these two into one. We're gonna be here twice as long, so buckle in. Uh, it's gonna be a long ride. I'm just kidding. Philippians chapter four, you can look this up in the YouVersion Bible app if you want, or you can follow along at efree.org slash Bible. It's all there for you. As we do this, remember that Paul is currently in prison when he's writing this, and he knows that he may not make it out alive. 
And so this is the guy who is sitting in the prison cell knowing that he may die, writing to a group of believers who are far away and saying, you guys need to rejoice. You guys need to be joyful. Joy, joy, joy. It's all over this letter in all these different circumstances. And he's describing to them, hey, here's what I'm facing right now. And yet I rejoice in the middle of this issue, in the middle of this difficult circumstance that I am in. It's all over it. And so we get to chapter four and we're just gonna work through verses four through nine this morning. Verse four of chapter four, I see as the key verse for the whole letter. Here's what it says. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Now I have one major complaint with this verse. Can anyone guess what it is? You got it. Always. Really? Like always, always? Like every situation that I face, every difficult thing, some of the worst news that I could have just received, and I'm supposed to rejoice in the middle of that? And Paul goes, yeah, always. Always be full of joy in the Lord. That is not an easy thing to do. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's really easy. A couple weeks ago, I was taking my son to school, and one of the teachers pulled me aside and said, hey, I just got to tell you, sometimes when we have prayer time here, goes to a Christian school, when we have prayer time here, uh, and your son prays, and he prays these intentional, meaningful prayers, I don't know where he comes up with this stuff, but it's just so beautiful, that's a time when it's easy for me to have joy. I tell you what, that's like, oh, I'm joyful, I'm beaming with pride, like, that's fantastic. But I got to be honest with you, parenting is not a process that automatically produces tons and tons of joy. And those of you who are parents know that. Now, I don't know where the scales tip in that thing, but there's a whole lot of stuff you got to clean up. And why is that broken? And what did you do to the dog? And why are there markers drawn all over everything? There's a lot of that stuff you have to deal with as a parent. Not everything produces a whole ton of joy. And that's probably true in your life too. I don't think I have to go through a list of all the things that you might have a hard time being joyful about. So let me just do it this way. I want you right now in your mind to think of the thing that's worrying you the most right now. What is that thing that is producing the most worry in your life at this moment? You got that? You got that thing in your mind? That word always. Man, it's so annoying. So imagine taking that thing that you just thought of, the most worrying thing in your life right now. Take that to the Apostle Paul and you bring that to him and you say, even this even this thing in my life, I have to rejoice in the midst of that. Here is what I think Paul might say back to you, okay? I'm sort of reading between the lines here. I think Paul might say back to you, you don't have to, you get to. There's an important distinction there. You don't have to rejoice, you get to rejoice. I wanna challenge your thinking about biblical commands here for a minute because a lot of times when I look at the commands of scripture, I'm, I'm guilty of this, I think of them in terms of the negative. Don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this. Lots of imperatives, lots of commands, things that we're supposed to do that we gotta make sure we do all of these different things. And the truth is that we shouldn't look at the commands of the Bible as a negative at all. They are all incredibly positive for us. All the commands of scripture, are incredibly positive for us. They have positive outcomes for us. It's not a have to, it's a get to. You don't have to avoid sin in your life. You get to avoid sin in your life. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to flee sexual immorality. You get to flee sexual immorality. It's not a have to, it's a get to. You don't have to rejoice in all circumstances. You have the capacity, you have the ability, you have the empowerment of a, whole, a heavenly father who supports you in this, who enables you to get to rejoice in the middle of any circumstance. It's not a have to, it's a get to. And not everyone out there has that. If, if you don't have Jesus in your life, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, if you don't have the hope of, of an eternal life with God when you die, then maybe you should be worried. You don't get to rejoice in all circumstances. You don't know that it's all gonna work out for good for you, but we, we who follow Jesus, we have this incredible privilege of knowing that we can rejoice in every circumstances because we know how it all works out in the end. We know how it works for us. If you have Jesus in your life, worry is optional. Remember, I'm not talking here about anxiety disorders. 
I'm talking about normal, everyday life struggles and worries. Worry is optional if you have Jesus in your life. And here's how I know this. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That means that if you love God and are called according to his purpose, you know that everything's gonna work out for good for you. Now, maybe it's not gonna work out the way you want it to. Maybe it's not gonna work out in your timing. Maybe it's not gonna work out even in this lifetime. But you know that ultimately your eternity is secure and you have this hope in God and you know that the end of this is really, really good for you. And so what point is there in worrying? Because we know that good things are ahead. We don't have to worry. So we have the privilege, the capacity, the support of a heavenly father that enables us to not have to worry, but to get to rejoice. And here is the question for us. Will we choose to use that privilege? See, that's the real question. Will we choose to use this incredible privilege that we have to rejoice in every circumstance? And by now, I hope you know how this goes for me. Because when I come across something like this, it sounds great, but I want to know one simple question, and that is, how? How? Okay, I see it on your social media. I see it on Pinterest, all these great phrases about not worrying. How do we do that? And the beautiful thing about the Bible, the beautiful thing about what Paul shares here is that he doesn't stop with this rejoice all the time. He's gonna give us incredible step-by-step guidance for how to do this. And it's not trite, and it's not overly simplistic, and it's not a Christian cliche. In fact, it will barely fit on a coffee mug. So this is good. He's gonna give us a five-step process for how to ditch our worries and rejoice in any circumstance. First, he's gonna share this. In verse five, he says, let everyone see that you are considerate and all that you do, remember the Lord is coming soon. So be nice to people because God is coming soon. And this gives you a reason to rejoice because the Lord is coming soon. And then he gets into these five steps. Here they are. Verse six says, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Remember, worry is the enemy of joy. It's a joy stealer. It's a thief of our joy. I want to tell you a little bit about this word, worry. It's the word merimnao in the Greek. It comes from two different words that mean a divided mind. This word is used 19 times in the New Testament. And I just want to show you two of those times that are very similar to what we're looking at here in Philippians 4. This is 1 Peter 5. In 1 Peter 5, we read, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. It's the same word, merimnao. It's the same word used in Luke 12 when Jesus says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if, you, if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? It's the same word, merimnao. And Paul says, don't worry about anything. Problem solved, right? That should be enough. You heard it. Don't worry about anything. Just stop worrying. Just stop it. And you'll be okay. That's not what Paul has in mind. He's got a whole lot more instruction for us here. Because that's, that's a lot easier said than done. I can't just go flip the switch and cut off all my worries. You know that. Some of you may have tried this. Some of you may have read this before or seen it on a bumper sticker or something and thought, I'm not supposed to worry about anything. It's bad that I'm worrying about things and now it's making it worse because I'm thinking about worrying. I'm worrying about worrying. I've entered some sort of a worry inception here. Do this for me. Close your eyes if you have to, but imagine a pink elephant. Would you do that? Just imagine a pink elephant. It can be big, it can be small. Imagine what shade of pink that elephant is. Imagine what that elephant is doing right now, that pink elephant that's in your mind. Okay, now stop. Seriously, stop. Like, don't think of a pink elephant anymore, okay? In fact, to help you with that, I'm gonna remind you periodically not to think of a pink elephant. Stop it. Don't think of what shade that pink elephant is. Don't think of what that pink elephant is doing. Just don't think about pink elephants at all. Do you see what I'm saying? It is hard to just stop doing something. Stop worrying. Don't do it. Don't do it anymore. Now I'm worried about worrying because the more you think about it, the more you want to do it. That's not enough. And that's not what Paul says. That's not where he stops. 
He gives us so much more. Step one is, yes, don't worry about anything. And if you've got your program with you, there are notes that you can fill these things in and go through with us if you want. We've also got a takeaway for you at the end that has all of that on it. Step one for dealing with our worries is don't worry about anything. Push the pause button on your worries. Don't allow those worries to take up residence in your mind, but that's only step one. We have to keep reading. We have to go through. Here's step two. He says, instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. It's amazing to me that sometimes the thing that we need the most is the last thing we think of to do. Have you ever done this, gone through a whole week worrying like crazy about something, and then you finally realize, hey, maybe I should pray about this? Like, that'd probably be a good thing to do. Why is it that we don't think about that until we've allowed these worries to take up residence in our mind? So he says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Here's the way I like to think about it. Turn your worries into prayer requests. Just convert them. Worry comes in, oh, stop. Turn that into a prayer request, give it over to God. Not saying that's the end of it. That's just two steps of a multi-step process. Stop your worries. Turn them into prayer requests. Mary C. Crowley was a Christian businesswoman. She worked with the Billy Graham Association, and she said this, every evening I turn worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. (laughs) So turn your worries over to God. Step three, thank him for all he has done. Now this is genius. This is absolutely brilliant. Because the antidote to worry is trust. The antidote to worry is trust. And Paul doesn't just say, hey, just trust in God. It'll all go away. I mean, you've all seen that out there. Just trust in God, trust in God. He doesn't say that. He says, here is something that will help you trust in God. I want you to think about all the things that you're thankful for that God has done for you. And then I want you to spend time thanking him. That process will lead you to trust in God. It's amazing. Spend some time. First, you stop your worries, turn your worries into prayer requests, and then think about all the things God has done for you. And then tell him those. Thank God for all that he has done. It's incredible. It's brilliant. So thank God for what he has done already. Paul knows that we need more than just to try to stop it. We need something else to do. Now we're up to verse 7. Philippians 4, 7. And here is what I would like for verse 7 to say at this point, okay? If I were writing the Bible, you can be thankful that I'm not. This is what I would put in verse 7. Then God will take away all your reasons for worrying, and you'll never struggle with worry again. I mean, isn't that what ought to come next? One, two, three. Three steps. Stop your worries, turn them into prayer requests, thank God for all he's done, and God will take away your reasons for worry. Yet that's not what he does. That's not what it says. What does it really say? Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And here's what's so amazing about this. There is a promise here. You will experience. But the promise is not that he will fix your problem. The promise is that he will give you peace in the midst of it. That's amazing to me. A promise that if you will push pause on your worries, turn them into prayer requests, spend time thinking about everything God has done for you and thanking him for that, that they promise that the peace of God will come upon you. I can tell you from personal experience, this has always been true in my life. The only times when I haven't experienced this is when I haven't gone through the steps. But when I do that, when I pray about my worries and I thank God for what he's done for me, I always feel so much better afterwards because the peace of God is reminding me of, look what God has done for you. You will experience God's peace. It exceeds anything we can understand. We can't fully understand the peace of God. It doesn't make sense with some of the stuff we go through. I mean, how can someone who just found out that they have cancer and have less than a year to live have peace? How can someone who just found out that they lost their child in an accident have peace? With some of the difficult situations that you're going through right now, it probably doesn't make sense to a lot of people that you could possibly have peace. It may not make sense to you. That is the kind of peace God offers. 
It is a peace that does not make human sense. It's a peace we can't understand. I love that Paul acknowledges that for us. So step four is to experience God's peace, which we cannot understand. There's another promise in here too. Paul says, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That word guard is a military term. It it refers to a sentinel. So a sentinel who would keep watch over a fortress or a, a certain area that he needed to watch over and guard and protect. He was a lookout, but he was also kind of a bouncer. He was able to defend against something. Guard, that's what God's peace is for us. It's like a, a bodyguard for us. It's, it's a peace that we can't understand from a human perspective, but it will guard our heart and mind. And get this, it's not just in the moment, but it's there to guard us like a sentinel. It's there to march back and forth around our heart and mind and to kind of guard against future attacks of worry. If we go through this, what Paul is saying is that God's going to give you peace that will last Not to say that your worries will all go away right away. Not to say that you'll never worry again. You will. But as you go through this process, you're going to get better at handling them because God is going to guard your heart and mind with his peace. We wrestle with our worries. We cry out to God and we say, God, won't you you just take this thing away? Can't you just solve this problem for me? Can't you just fix this? Can't you just remove these things? Can't you just take care of my problem? And here's what God says to us. He says, it's more important to me that you rely on and trust on me than that I give you an easy life. It's more important to me that you have to go through these steps that draw you close to me so you can have a close relationship with me than that I just make everything so simple for you. Than that I just take away all of your problems. Paul struggled with this. Remember Paul had this condition that he called his thorn in the flesh and he said he begged God three times to take away whatever that thing was that he struggled with and what did God say to him? My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And it could be that whatever your thing is that you're worrying about right now is something that God doesn't want to take away because his power is at work in the middle of it. He can take that and use that and do something incredible with that and use you to even be a blessing to other people because of what you're going through right now. He may choose not to remove the thing you're worrying about, but he does promise if you will follow his principles to give you the peace of God that doesn't make sense to us. See, I think we often forget that what we need sometimes isn't a miracle. It's a miraculous God and a close walk with him. So step five is this, trust his peace to guard your heart and mind. Paul's prescription isn't a quick fix. It's not a one and done. It's not a miracle pill. It is a recipe for a closer relationship with God. But he doesn't even stop there. See, Paul understands replacement therapy. Paul knows that we can't just stop that thing and remove that thing and try to deal with that thing and not replace it with something else. So he's gonna go on in the next verse and give us some absolutely incredible guidance. Look at verse eight. He says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Eight things that Paul mentions, and what's so amazing about this to me is that he could have been very specific. He chose not to be. Sometimes the most incredible thing as I study God's word isn't just what's in there, but it's what's not in there that could have been. See, Paul has the language to say other things. Paul could have said, whenever you're struggling with worry, follow these five steps, and then I want you to think about creation. Or follow these five steps, and then I want you to think about your salvation. Or then I want you to think about the miracle of children, or whatever it is. But he wasn't that specific. What he gave us was eight categories. Why? This is Paul's workbook. This is for you to fill in the blanks. What do you find to be true? When you think about something that is honorable or pure or admirable, what pops into your head? Paul didn't specify what you had to think about. 
But he wants you to think about some of these good things, eight types of things. There's a spot on your program where you could fill in what those things are. We're going to have a takeaway for you where you can fill in what those things are and keep it with you. So that when you follow these steps, you don't just leave it at that, but then you replace those worries, you replace those negative thoughts in your head with something positive. I mean, Paul was a genius. Of course, we know where that genius came from. The Holy Spirit, as he inspired and guided him to say these things. And then Paul says at the end, keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Two things I want to note about this. Keep putting into practice sure doesn't sound like one and done to me. This is a continual thing that you will have to do over and over and over for the rest of your life, and that's exactly how God wants it, because it drives you back to him. As you struggle with worries and wrestle with anxiety in your life, he wants to draw you closer to him. That's why sometimes he doesn't just take these problems away. The other thing I want you to notice is he says, then the God of peace will be with you. So you can have the peace of God and you can have the closeness of the God of peace with you. So I want to close with a story. It's a personal story of a time when this really hit home in my life. I love playing sports. I should probably say I loved playing sports because after all of the injuries to my knees, it's really hard to, to play anything anymore without getting hurt. I played basketball and soccer and baseball and ultimate frisbee and ping pong. And yes, ping pong is a sport. <laughs> I, I pulled a hamstring playing ping pong. I'm a little ashamed to admit this, but one time I was playing ping pong and I actually messed up my knee so bad I needed surgery. Have any of you had a ping pong injury that required surgery? <laughs> I didn't think so. The reason that happened is because earlier uh, I played a lot of basketball and I had a lot of injuries and I tore my ACL. And one time I was in Costa Rica on a missions trip and we were playing ultimate frisbee on a really bad field with holes in it all over the place. And as I, I uh, lunged through the air to catch a a frisbee and I landed in a hole and I popped my leg and I tore my other ACL, my good one. I went to a surgeon to see if it, how I needed to approach this and he said, well, I mean, you've been through this enough times before that you kind of know the drill. You can, you can make it by until you get back and then have the surgery. And so a couple days later, we uh, went zip lining, had to climb all these trees and zip line through and as long as you clinch really hard, you can do it. But I've been through enough of those that I understand what that's like. So one day, several years ago, before our kids were born, I was crazy sick, just really, really rough shape, and Jenny had to leave for something she was going to, so I was home alone, just me and the dogs, and I got so bad that I realized, man, I really need to go see a doctor, because this is getting pretty rough. So I, did, I peeled myself out of bed, and I managed to think, you know, I should probably feed the dogs before I go. It'd be nice for them to eat tonight. So... I got the dog food, I got over to, one of them was still in a crate at this time, it's a huge crate, big, big old crate. And she had redecorated her crate so that the dog dish was now in the back. So I had to get down on all fours and crawl into this crate, pull out the dog dish, pour in the dog food, and when I went to stand up, my leg couldn't. It was locked like this at a 90 degree angle. Not only that, but when I tried to straighten it, it, it shot excruciating pain through my whole body, so I just collapsed to the ground and looked around like, did I get shot or something? Like, this is pure, just horrible pain. And now I'm there lying on the ground, horribly sick, with a leg that I can't extend and I can't walk. The best I can do is do one of these. And if you've played sports before and you've had to do this kind of stuff, you know there's only so long you can actually pull this off before it starts to get really, really hard. So I got back down on all fours and I crawled to the front door and I realized now I've really got to go to the doctor. I've got two good reasons instead of one. So I made it to the front door and I realized as I'm crawling, I now have 40 feet of rough concrete between me and my car and I'm in shorts. Do I crawl all the way across this really hard chopped up concrete to get there or what do I do? And I figured it out. 
I got back into my stance. And I did one of these. <laughs> and it was uh, about here to the door. I'm not going to go the whole way. And I finally made it over to my car. Could not extend my knee. So I'm down here fumbling with my keys, trying to get into my car. Cars are driving by. And I realize it looks like I'm trying to steal this car. <laughs> but I finally got into it. And I made my way to the doctor and I got some medicine and everybody found out and all my friends texted me and said, we're praying for you, hope you get better soon, hope you can stand and walk soon and all that good stuff. And I just had this weird, weird thought. Maybe this has happened to you. I had this weird thought. What if I never get better? Like, what if God just decides not to answer their prayers? What if God decides, you know what, it's gonna bring me more glory for him to stay sick and unable to walk for the rest of his life. And then, you ever do this? I kind of got meta about it, where I was worrying that because I was worrying about it, God might do it. You know? Like, I'm worried this might happen, and oh no, is God going to do it now? Because he's like, hmm, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> I'll bet that would teach you some things done. <laughs> and as stupid as that sounds, I had a moment there where I realized, huh, if that were to happen, if God were to just allow me to be in a condition like that for the rest of my life, which some people are. Some people are horribly sick their whole life. Some people can't walk. If God allowed me to be in a position like that, could I rejoice in the middle of that? Like, what if God did that? Could I, still, could I still have a, a rewarding life, a satisfying life, a fulfilling life if God wanted me to? Could I, could I still rejoice in the middle of that because of all he's done for me? And I realized, wow, I, I probably could. I could rejoice even if God decided to do that. And so if that's the case, here's the key. If that's the case, what sense is there in me worrying about this? Because if the worst case scenario is I still end up in eternity with God, then what am I so worried about? God is not surprised by my worries. He's not up there going, oh, wow, that is bad. When you turn your worries over to him, he says, yeah, I got this. I can see the beginning and the end. I have promised you a wonderful future. I know what's in store for you, what's planned for you, and it is good. It's not to harm you, but it's good for you. I know the outcome of all of this. Why are you so worried about this? Does any of this resonate with you? Do you see yourself in what we're talking about today? Do you struggle with these worries that you wrestle with in your everyday life? Like what's God doing right now? Why doesn't he take away this thing that I'm struggling with? Maybe there's something over the last couple of months as we've been working through this series that you have just had a really hard time rejoicing in. And some of you have shared those things with me already or sent me emails about those where something's popped up and God has just convicted you to say, hey, you need to rejoice in the middle of this. Here's what I want to ask you to do. In the seat in front of you, there's a little slip of paper. You can see it there. It's got little marks on the edges. Pull that slip of paper out. And if there is something that God has been speaking to your heart to say, you need to turn this over to me. You need to rejoice in the middle of this thing. You need to stop worrying about this thing. Or maybe it's just a difficult circumstance that you're in that's really discouraging. And you need to rejoice in the middle of that. And it's hard to do. But I want to ask you to put that thing on there if you're willing to do this. If you're willing to say, I'm going to commit to rejoice in the middle of even this. And here's the thing. After you do that, we're gonna sing a song here. Our worship team's gonna sing. I'm gonna invite you to bring that slip of paper with whatever that thing is that you're gonna commit to rejoice over and put it in one of the baskets around the auditorium. We have baskets up here. We have baskets in the back. We have baskets in the balcony. Bring that slip of paper and don't just drop it in the basket. As you're dropping it in the basket, pray and say, God, I am committing to rejoice over this. And here's the key. Even if you don't take it away, even if you don't solve what I think is my problem, I commit to rejoice over this. And when you do that, we don't want you to leave empty-handed. 
we've got two things for you. The first thing is a card with counselor and care information on it. Our support groups are on here. If you're struggling with one of these things and, and need some real help, this is here to help you. And for everyone, there's a card that has the five steps that we talked about today. Five steps, you can keep this in your wallet or put it somewhere you'll remember it so that whenever you are struggling with worry, this is not a one and done thing. This is a keep it handy and pull it out and go through the steps. And then on the back are the eight types of things that you're supposed to think about instead and some blanks for you to write in what to you represents truth and what is honorable and right and pure so that you can keep this handy. And every time you are struggling with worry, you can pull this out and remember, I'm gonna stop my worries in their tracks. I'm gonna turn my worries into prayer requests. I'm gonna spend time thanking God for what he's done for me. And then I'm gonna experience God's peace and trust his peace to guard my heart and mind. And then I'm gonna turn my thoughts to what's on the other side of this. That's what I'm gonna dwell on. That's what I'm going to think about. If there is something in your life that God has been speaking to you that you need to rejoice in, I encourage you as we sing this song, come to one of the baskets, commit that to the Lord and grab this as a takeaway.